So I know some of you are so tired of this car metaphor. <laughs> it is like the metaphor that never ends. There is something alive in it for us now. It is worth taking our time to work something. So I want to share something with you, a question that came up two weeks ago about why I don't wanna get back into the car. And for those of you who weren't with us two weeks ago, this metaphor that Debbie alluded to is a story from the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. And she tells the story of driving with her friend and they are happily ensconced in a moving protected vehicle and they see signs all around them that there has been a flood and they think they can just go on as normal. So they just keep on their dirt road until they realize the flood is here and it is now and it is all around them and they have to leave their car. And so they scurry up a hill and they sit beneath a fir tree, soaked. That is the end of her story. And so two weeks ago, I said to you that I am soaked 
I'm totally soaked and I'm beneath the fir tree and damn it, I'm not getting back in the car. Now, some of you have lots of different interpretations of what the car means to you, but for now, I wanna tell you about what this car means to me and why I'm not getting back into it. Now, there is a book, Edward Hume, Humes, and he writes this book, Door to Door, The Magnificent, Maddening, Mysterious World of Transportation. And it's basically a takedown of the car. But I appreciate it. Here is his takedown of the car, if we're leaving the metaphor aside only briefly. Cars are symbols of our supposed autonomy. It is about my freedom, my movement, my comfort. They're damaging, as our climate scientists well know, carbon dependent, a leading cause of global warming. The very flood that stops the car is caused by the very thing that kept the car going in the first place. They're wasteful. Admit how long your car sits lonely and absent from you, unless you're an avid traveler in your car, sitting sadly alone in your garage, waiting 92% of the time on average to be used. It is isolating the majority of us driving place to place alone. It's subsidized harm. If we were to calculate the real costs to one gallon of gas at the time of his writing, he speculated $10 a gallon. It's the leading cause of death, top five in the United States. He wrote since 9-11, 400,000 people have died from cars and airplane a week. When we drive past an accident, admit it, if it doesn't look like it was too bad, your first reaction might be annoyance. Not even knowing if a death or how much harm was caused. Now, this is not a shame sermon. I drove my car here. I actually can see it past the camera and through the window. This has nothing to do with you or I being bad people. This is about you and I reckoning with living in a culture designed for daily disaster. And that the implications of the decisions we make, that we make in good faith, driving our cars to care for loved ones, driving our cars to do good work, driving our cars to be part of community. The things we do in good faith are making the things that are harmful invisible. The ripples of our decisions invisible. We did not choose it. You were born on a highway. The automobile industry and policies that have shaped our world make it so that even when you have a choice, if you have a public transportation choice at all, you still have what the industry calls the first mile and last mile problem. This cultural desire that we don't have to walk that bit to the bus and then to our other location, but the longing that we be carried door to door without struggle. We have this culture of automobility, autopilot. We didn't choose it, and yet we have to choose it every day. So when I say, I just don't want to get back in the car, <laughs> when I say to you though it hit a flood, and there's a fir tree, and I like the fir tree better. What I'm trying to say is this culture of autopilot, individualism, personal distraction, and generational problem postponement. I don't want it anymore. Now, the metaphor of the car is like how cars show up in our dreams. 
Some of you, all of you, I believe, probably have dreamt about some kind of vehicular situation in a dream. And in some forms of dream interpretation, the way to deal with that might be to look at the car as the way you are being carried through the world. Now, this was fitting. As I was dreaming about the sermon last night, I had a dream. I had a dream that I was in a tiny airplane and me and my partner, Andrew, were in the back. And there was some guy in the pilot seat with a cigarette and joy was in the co-pilot seat and he was letting joy drive and i thought to myself this is exactly how i'm being carried through my life right now i am in a tiny plane my child is driving and somehow we're still flying but this is exactly what i mean when I say, I want you to hold this car metaphor with me, how are we being carried? And do we still want to be carried that way? Do we still want to be carried that way? When I think about what that carriage means, it means to me that we are valuing more the individual rather than the collective. It's about where I want to go when I want to go there and I want to listen to the music I like the whole way. Rather, what if we were driven into the collective? Collective care, collective being, collective decisions. What if it was easy to make decisions that ripple out healing instead of harm? And when I say I don't want to get back in the car, I'm talking about I want to unravel my economy of personal distraction and consumption. That I don't want to be so easily driven towards the thing that makes me feel safe and comfortable, but that I want to be fueling my energy towards imaginative possibilities towards experiments, even if failed, of a way of being that is more healing than harming. And when I say I don't want to get back in the car, if I could just, you know, hit this point one more time, I'm saying that I don't want to be part of generational problem postponement. I don't want to be part of the feeling like we know something isn't working and yet we are with so much momentum, we just can't even help it. It almost brings tears to my eyes because I feel this every day when I look at my own child. That we know the way we are moving is untenable. And yet it is so hard to stop. I ache to be part of generational healing inheritance where we right now take our space and our money and our bodies and our wisdom and we imagine unburdening our future. So when I say I don't want to get back in the car, I assume now that I will get a coffee mug at some point in the next week that says, don't worry, we won't make you, but maybe one of us will. And another one of you might be like shotgun because it's very, very hard. I don't mean to make this sound simple, but I do mean that we are at a position of possibility because a flood came and it stopped us in our tracks. Now I ride the car very willingly. And for this example, I'm talking about our collective church car. Now when me and Andrew first moved here, Andrew had never seen me as a minister, believe it or not. He'd seen me as a community organizer, as a facilitator. He saw me lead circles and grow gardens. But Sam as minister in this kind of space was new to him. Now, Drew is a great hype guy, if you know Drew. And so on the drive to my first sermon with you, he was gearing up for what he calls the Sam action. Now, in his previous life, the Sam action meant 
talking deeply about our feelings and probably crying. Now he was standing in the back of beautiful savior for my first Sunday with you. And he lovingly looked on with his very attractive hat, but beside the point. And at the end of it, I felt so overwhelmed with love for our community and we were connecting. And it was that sermon, if you remember, do you remember the sermon about the earthquake? That we were to lean into the abyss together not pushing it away or forcing it quickly, but leaning. Now on the drive home, I was exhausted, emotionally, spiritually, socially. And I said what any minister says to their partner. I said, did you like it? Now there is one response to the question, did you like it? But what I love about Drew is he almost never lies to me. He said, well, you didn't make them do anything. I said, no, it's church. It's church, you don't make them do things. It's like, well, you like, didn't make them talk to each other about their feelings. I said, baby, no, it's church. He's like, well, you, they didn't move and inter interact. You didn't, they didn't get in circles. They didn't like build things. They didn't, do we just sit there? Genuine questions. Baby, it's church. Yes, you just sit there. The pews, they are nailed into the ground. Just sit there. He's like, so church is where they come and sit and listen to you? Yeah, baby, it's church, absolutely. But yes, I felt self-conscious because the way I know transformation, if I am honest with you, does not look like we always do on Sunday morning. And I could not imagine what he was asking of me, that church could be different. I myself knew the church car. I grew up in it, I'm trained in it, and I know it well. I got right in, started driving. Now my own fear is that that took a different shape. Would people go with me? Would it be vital? Would we, would we lose people? Would people come? I had a hard time imagining something different at all. Now it turns out that was not a crisis of resource because when COVID-19 hit, all of us did something different. What it was was a crisis of imagination, of risk-taking and of willingness. In a book that I am loving right now, Paradise Built in Hell, the author Rebecca Solnit looks at different moments of disaster in our history. But what she pays attention to is not what the media paid attention to, the, the ways that things went wrong. What her story focuses on is the ways that civil society comes up from the grassroots to take care of each other. And in fact, the things that are top down, that think they can solve things by getting it back together again, fail us more often than not. She looks at 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina, and she tracks the relationships in which new ways of being grew in the midst of disaster. And her thesis is this, the disaster not to be romanticized is opportunity. It wipes all the structures and confinements that then allow something new to emerge that could not have emerged if we were driving along. She writes that this is the possibility, that in the face of disaster, what we see is our real human nature, the nature that reaches out and relies on organizations and interdependencies to keep us alive. Now we are in the daily disaster, cars aside, but COVID-19 provided an opportunity that you 
seized, carrying heart circles, showing up with medicine, groceries, sharing food, sharing money, surprising abundance. Could this be our way of being long after the most obvious of disasters? I don't know what your individual work is. Maybe your individual work has something to do with your ability to give more. Sometimes it is about privileges. Sometimes it's about intergenerational healing from traumas. Sometimes we're cleaning up marriages, cleaning up family systems, cleaning up our alcoholism, cleaning up our relationship to our bodies that have caused us harm, cleaning up our relationship to media. I don't know what you have to do in your individual car, but I do know that this place is our collective experiment the opportunity we have together here, regardless of the complexities of each of our lives, cars or bicycles, the opportunity we have here is to experiment with transformation. This is the place of our collective experimenting this is our place where we shift from individualism to collective well-being this is a place where we can experiment with shifting from our comfort to our imaginations and this is a place that could be the center of healing inheritance So join me beneath the fir tree. Come, if you have been wrecked by COVID or by racism or by homophobia or by disability injustice, come, if you have been wrecked by a system, by capitalism that has not worked for you. Come, if it has worked for you, but you wanna give it all away. Come, if you are trying to figure out the way you want to move with healing in this world. Come, if you have been hurt and want to be part of healing. Come, be wrecked with us. We can do this together. May it be so.